All right, we are in our third week of A Generous Life, The Beauty of Giving, or The Beauty in Giving? The Beauty of Giving, I was right. Okay, uh, we've been going through this series looking at what it means to be generous according to God, because God's standard, God's expectation of our generosity is different than what culture may expect of us. And especially as we come to Christmas, Culture has conditioned us that Christmas is all about what we get. And the first week we looked about that is not actually about what you get. It's about what you are able to give. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the la- last week we looked at how uh, <clears throat> our motives when it comes to giving are important to God. Our heart is important to what to God when it comes to our giving. We're going to unpack that a little bit more this morning, but it is easy it is God is concerned that we are not just given to those that can give back, but in fact, He encouraged us in, his, in the teaching to seek out those who are not able to give back, to seek out those who can't repay us. Because if we only give to those who can repay us, we've already gotten our reward. If we only give to get the pat on the back, we've already got our reward. And the encouragement last week is that we should be seeking out opportunities to get a heavenly reward, an eternal reward that will never fade away, that can never be stolen. And this morning we're going to continue on with this idea um, <clears throat> of our kind of our heart and what God God's really concerned about the quality and not so much the quantity of the gift that we give. And to unpack this, we're in Mark chapter 12. I encourage you to look it up on your phone or open the Bible. It's on your table. It will be on the screen, but Um, I'm going to breeze past something, but I want you to have it in front of you because we're going to reference it. A little bit of context as you turn there. Mark chapter 12, Jesus starts, the chapter starts off by Jesus talking about inheritance and he starts talking about taxes and how we're to give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's and and then he parks and he's, he unpacks for the Pharisees what is the most important commandment according to the NLT. If you got it in front of you, uh, I think it's, cha- it's verse 30, 29, somewhere in there. What is the most important commandment according to Jesus as he's talking to these Pharisees? To love God with all your heart. To love God with all of your soul, to love God with all of your mind, and to get love God with all of your strength. Love God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And to love others as you love yourself. Um, I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it later on. Uh, and then Jesus continues on and he gets to the end of Mark chapter 12 and we have this really interesting Story. I'm going to read it to you, starting in verse 41. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Okay, so we're going to pause right there. It drives me crazy because it's the best part coming, but I'm going to set the stage for you, and I want you to put yourself in the story. I want you to imagine what is going on. I think this is one of the important tools that we need to take advantage of when we're reading through scriptures. Not just read it as a story, but actually let your heart and your mind and your senses engage with what's going on. To actually put yourself in the story and let God kind of teach you what is going on because it's, we can sometimes miss it if we don't kind of insert ourselves what's going on. And so I want to set the stage for you. Jesus is at the temple and he has decided to park himself by this offering box. And a few months ago, we talked about how this offering box was set aside as kind of in the corner of the temple and everything that went in was to go to the poor. And this box was designed, it had, they call it a horn, but essentially it was a funnel. And you drop your money in the funnel so that the money went in, but it didn't come back out due to sticky fingers. The only way it got out is that someone had the key to unlock it and pull it out so they could distribute it to the poor. Well, this great big metal funnel combined with, at the time, this idea of paper money would have been foreign to them. Everything was coins. So you take metal coins and you throw it at a metal funnel. What happens? 
It's a little bit of clanging, a little bit of sound making. And so Jesus is sitting here watching the people put their offerings into this box. Clang, 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 clang. And he's watching. And no doubt people would have been showing up and they would have made sure, right? This was their opportunity to kind of flex, you know, look how much... You know, throw it as a little extra harder to make sure everyone knew that today I was being a little exceptionally generous. Or maybe it was the opportunity that, you know, they did this little, little light so they would kind of put it in gently so they didn't, didn't hear it. It was their opportunity to kind of flex, like, oh, look at how good I am. Look at how generous I am being. Because everyone would be listening, right? Somebody walks in and... Oh... Look at their, they must really love God. Look at how much they threw in. So generous. So, so giving. Right? There was this kind of this flex. And, and so we, what we find is kind of this third enemy. As we've been going through, we've been looking at these enemies of generosity. The first one was coveting. You know, we, we withhold our generosity because there's something that we want. And, and we can't be generous because it's going to get in the way of us getting it. And so coveting can get in the way of our generosity. And hypocrisy can get in the way of true generosity. It's this show. It's, it's not really about what's going on on the inside. It's all about what's going on on the outside. And hypocrisy can often kind of be mixed in with this thing called pride. I am a self-made individual. Look at how well I've done. Look at the, the fruit of my labor. Look at how much I'm putting in. Clang, clang, clang. Clang, 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 clang. And on and on it goes. The money gets dropped in. And everyone's just like, look at me. The crowds, no doubt, are taking note of, oh, wow. Look at how much they're dropping in. But the interesting thing is, as it's all happening, do you know who is not impressed? Jesus isn't impressed. He doesn't, he's not like caught up in it. He's not taking note. He's just standing there. And you know that if he's sitting there, the, the motley crew of disciples are always nearby. And they're probably caught up in this because this is a centuries old tradition of people walking in and dropping in their offering. But Jesus isn't impressed until this next part of the story. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples. Guys, come here. Come here, come here, come here. I want to show you something. Come here, quick. I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. In the midst of all the noise, in the midst of all of the impressive gifts that were no doubt being dropped, in this show of wealth, in this show of generosity, you know, kind of like birds fluffing their feathers, like, look at me! Jesus pauses everything for this widow. And we know that the two small coins she put on were called two mites, and it would have been less than a penny. Now, for those of you that don't know what a penny was, there's this coin that we used to have that was a fifth of a nickel. You know, they kind of, now we just throw, you know, they're, <clears throat> like, like, you can't even compare it to a nickel because it doesn't even compare to a penny how small her offering was. Or Jesus says it's all she had to live on. And he points out to the disciples that everybody else is given out of their surplus. Everybody else had disposable income that they could throw in. It didn't really cost them anything. They just happened to have these coins you know, in the, in the pickle jar. Or they just happened to have some spare change in their pockets. Or they had this set apart that didn't impact anything that was going on in their life. But this widow, that's all she had. You have to remember that in those days, widows and orphans would have had nothing. If they didn't have their husband and their dad to provide for them, there was no income. There was no money. There was no you know, RSP. There was no 
retirement fund. There's nothing. She would have had to scrape together these mites. And then when the time came, when she had the option of looking out for herself and providing for herself or showing her love for her God, she chose to love God. She chose to act in obedience. She chose to inconvenience, maybe cause a little bit of comfort because she was honoring the one who loved her, who provided for her, right? We under, one of the things that Jesus teaches us is that everything we have is a gift from the Almighty. And so she inconveniences herself. She gives out of her lack, out of love and admiration and obedience to her heavenly Father. And one of the things that Jesus is trying to draw out in this story is we often get distracted by quantity. And it could be whether we're given to the church or we're given to our friends or our family, right? We compare notes, right? How much are we given this year? I want every gift to be 50 bucks. Well, I can't afford that. So, you know, and that's where the argument comes in, right? Because we, va we put value according to how much it costs how much we give, which uncle can show up with a bigger van full of gifts, right? Like this is the thing we get caught up in. And Jesus is like, it doesn't matter how much. I'm not concerned about quantity. I'm concerned about quality. It's the thought that counts. As cliche as that may be, this is actually where Jesus, and this is where he is trying to lead us as not where they gave out of their abundance because they could afford to give, she gave out of the spot of she can't afford not to give. And the reminder is, especially as we come to Christmas and we have this talk about, about generosity, like I just can't afford to be generous right now. The reminder is, is that we all have something to give. It doesn't matter what the bank account ha has. It doesn't matter how tight things may seem. Be you have something to give. You, In fact, we're going to look at another passage here in a shortly. You have something that only you can give. You have something that only you can offer, whether it's the body or the community or your family. <clears throat> but the idea that Jesus is looking for is, do we have a heart that seeks to give no matter what? what it might be. One of the, recently there was a study came out, there's this idea that, uh, well, I'll give when, when I can afford it, right? There, there's that kind of mindset. And if you've got this thought, this isn't me kind of picking on you. This, I think we've all had this thought, right? I'm going to withhold my generosity. I'm going to withhold my giving for, for this time because things are a little tight. But when I have more money, when I have more available to me, it might not be, even be money, it might be time, it might be talent, it might be energy, whatever it is. When I have more, then I'll start being generous with it. Then I'll start giving. Well, back in 2010, New York Times came out with a study that said that actually those with lower income tend to be more generous. They be more generous, tend to be more charitable, tend to be more trusting, and tend to be more willing to help others in need than those who have more wealth. Those with lower incomes tend to be more generous than those with more wealth. In fact, another study came out and said that what, when we say that, well, when I have more, I'll give more, the study actually shows that actually what tends to happen is even as our income starts to increase, we just give the same amount, we just have more disposable income. And so if you are giving nothing when you have nothing, chances are studies suggest that you probably will continue to give nothing. You continue to be generous. You continue to not be generous because we just see it as more, more for me. <coughs> so, what is the state of our heart? Is our heart that of well, I got to look out for me? And this is the this is the other thing that tends to happen is, and everybody falls in this category. 
when we look at our lives and we look at the story of our lives, the most important person in the world is me. It's one of the greatest struggles that each and every one of us as believers will always face is that we always want to make it all about me. And the challenge is always sacrificing that will, sacrificing that, that self-elevated image of ourselves and, and saying, no, actually, it's not all about me. It's all about Him. And with that, I want you to turn to Romans 12. Starting in verse 3. Paul writes this to the church in Romans. A uh, reminder, just a little context, Paul has never met these people. Paul's never met the believers in Rome, but he's writing to them to encourage them. And so this is what he says in Romans 12. If you've never read Romans 12, highly encourage it. It's a good one. Paul says this, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Paul's like, you're not the most important person in the world. Sorry to say. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Your gift is serving others. Serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And I want to park there. So because now this gift is this list isn't exhaustive, right? Well, I don't see my gift there. No, that's not the point Paul's trying to make. The other point Paul isn't trying to make is that only certain people can be kind. I don't have the gift of kindness, so I'm just gonna be brutal and honest and hurt everyone's feelings because that's not my gift. No, it's not what Paul's saying. Paul's not saying that only certain people have to be generous and the rest of us have to be hoarders and hold on to everything tight-fisted. No! What he's saying is that some people are exceptionally kind. Some people have been gifted in such a way they can be exceptionally generous. That generosity just comes naturally to them. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card being like, well, you know, I'm looking at that list and... Mm. Not generous. I don't, don't feel like I have the gift, so I don't have to be. No, it's not what Paul's saying. What Paul is saying is that each and every one of us has a gift, that we're a part of this body, and that gift is unique, that gift is important, and the gift that God has given you, you have to have open hands and be willing to give and to give it generously. If you don't know what your gift is, or if you don't know what your gifts are, uh, one of the came upon a question that they said. They said, if, if you're trying to figure out what your spiritual gift or what your gifting might be, ask yourself this question. If you were in charge and had to change anything, what would you change? If you were in charge, and you could change something, what would you change? change and an impeccable and inevitably what will happen is you'll change the thing that best suits what you are gifted in so if you were in charge what would you change and that would be point to the gift that god has given you but more importantly the point is is that it doesn't matter what's in the bank account it doesn't matter what you have to offer or how little it is it doesn't matter the quantity doesn't matter the fact is is that god has given you something and that something is something that is unique and special and it is only given to you for such a time as this. And so what Jesus is looking for is that in our heart, are we willing to give what we have? Instead of always comparing and looking to others, being like, well, I don't have what they have, so I can't give anything at all. Well, no, that's, that's not what Jesus is looking for. Jesus is looking for a generous heart. A heart that says, well, I have these two mites. But I have isn't very much, but 
I want to honor and I want to give and I want to serve my God with all that I am, and so I'm going to give what I've got. So Paul calls us to an honest evaluation. What have you got? What have you got to offer? What have you got to give? And are you willing to open your hands and give it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, I thank you for the reminder that you have called us to generosity. And it's not a generosity that's fueled by the things of this world, but it's a generosity fueled by the fact that your Spirit dwells within us and you give so generously all the time. Jesus, as we come to Christmas, we remember that you selflessly, humbly became a man. You became like one of us. You were the God of the universe. You were there when creation came, but you became like one of us so that you could give the perfect gift, make the perfect sacrifice for each and every one of us. And so, God, we are called to imitate you. We're called to be generous as you are generous. And so, God, I pray for the reminder that it's not about how much we give, but just the willingness to love and to serve and to give what we have. Because, God, your word calls us to love you with everything, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. God, when you take those four things into account, there's not a whole lot left. So God, help us to be generous with what you have entrusted. Not what you've entrusted to others, not what we wish we had, but what we have, God, may we have open hands and give it freely whenever the situation calls for it. God, I pray for open eyes to see the opportunities to be generous the way You've called us to be generous. Be with us as we discuss. Be with us as we go. Um, we give you all our praise and thanks in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.